And hello, everybody, and welcome to the Movie Pit Podcast. I am your host, Christian. We have a very stacked podcast today, so I'm just going to jump right into it. No pleasantries, no nothing. Let's get straight to the news. So some big news items came out last week once I put out the podcast. I thought that the Memorial Day weekend would hold off some movie news, but I was wrong. And a lot of studios started dropping these news items. So we're going to talk about some of them. Of course, we're not going to get to talk about every news item that came out this week because that would be just utterly ridiculous if we did but there are some news items that came out this week that we will not talk about on the podcast so if you want to see those news items you are more than happily welcome to go to the facebook page at facebook.com slash movie pit a link will be down below in the description area where you guys can go uh check out the news items that came out uh last week since the last podcast uh, we're we're going to talk about a good chunk of them that came out last week and this week, so you don't have to worry about that. But there are some news items I had to cut out. Again, it was just a big, stacked week this week for news, so we're just going to jump into the, the, the real big ones that came out. And the ones that stuck out to me, because it is my podcast, and I like to talk about some certain stuff. Well, we'll be talking about some news items, starting with last week's news items. Lionsgate sees seven potential Power Rangers films. That's right, seven. Lionsgate CEO John uh, Featherheimer says that he sees the new Power Rangers films being a huge franchise so much that he sees them doing five or six or seven, is direct quote. That seems like a real ambitious plan, especially since the first one hasn't even come out yet, and the pictures that have come out of the Power Rangers suits was, you know, very mixed, to, to say the least. So the idea of them doing seven Power Rangers films sounds ridiculous now, but you don't reboot and cast young actors in a Power Rangers film if you don't see yourself doing more than just one. So we'll find out more, especially once the film comes out next year on March 24th, if Power Rangers franchise is uh, is in the works for us, so I'll see. The third installment of the Maze Runner series took a big hit when Dylan O'Brien suffered a a serious injury that turned out to be even more serious than we thought, or originally thought, uh, during a stunt that he did. So the production and the studio decided to shut down until he was okay to come back and when they can get everyone else back. Well, it turns out that, you know, they have a pretty decent plan-ish. It's been delayed a year, so... And Dylan O'Brien has uh, been recovering nicely. He's going to go film another movie in the meantime to see if they can bring in, you know, more of the cast members. So, The Maze Runner, The Death Cure, was originally supposed to be released on February 17th next year. But now the new release date is on January 12th of 2018. Now, there's no word yet on when production will start, but again, Dylan O'Brien is already in talks to join another movie. He seems to be doing a hell of a lot more better than than I guess he was originally. Again, they're just waiting to see when they can get everyone back. You know, a lot of them are off doing other stuff. It would make sense that they would wait off, and of course, they don't want to probably throw Dylan O'Brien back into very stunt-heavy material when you know he's probably at this point still recovering so good news for fans of uh, Dylan O'Brien bit of a bad news for fans of the of the Maze Runner who wanted to see the movie or are waiting to see the movie next year now they'll just have to wait another full year two years essentially to watch the movie Steven Sodenberg's Logan Lucky adds Daniel Craig and Katherine Heigl a couple weeks ago it was announced that Steven Sodenberg will return to the big screen to direct another film after being away since 2013 with his movie Side Effects. The film will follow two brothers who plan a heist during a high-profile NASCAR race. The cast already includes Channing Tatum, Adam Driver, Riley Kehoe, and Seth MacFarlane. Now the cast has, like I mentioned, added Katherine Heigl and Daniel Craig. Now there's no word on who either of them will play yet, but Tatum and Driver will play the brothers. Of course, Craig now attached. People are wondering, where does this leave James Bond? Now, of course, rumors have been passed along for uh, two weeks now that Craig that he passed on a major, major paycheck, which probably was not the case. But Craig has signed on to other projects since then. He signed on to a limited TV series called Purity that just received a 20 or uh, 20 episode order. And that's a huge chunk of time for Craig to be, you know, pretty busy 
from not doing anything James Bond related. So, kind of does look like maybe Daniel Craig is out of the James Bond character. Now, again, there's been conflicting reports that Daniel Craig still has one film left on his contract. So, we'll see what happens. But, nonetheless, he's now a part of this film, Logan Lucky, which sounds great, has a great cast so far, and it brings back Steven Sonnenberg to the big screen, which is okay with me. Now, we're not done talking about James Bond. There's two news items that came out last week that we're going to talk about. Uh, one of them was one of the Bond producers and owners of the film, uh, owners of the film rights, uh, Barbara Bro- Broccoli. It was reported that she had been talking, or she had had talks, with Jamie Bell to join the Bond film. Now, there's no word yet of whether he was actually, there was no confirmation, I should say, that the talks were him taking over James Bond or maybe just being a part of the film. But with all the Daniel Craig stuff going on, we can probably assume that she was talking to Jamie Bell for the role of James Bond. Because without Bond, you don't really know who to cast as a villain or a supporting character if you don't know the dynamic of, you know, who's playing him. So anyway, she met with Jamie Bell and there was no, you know, kind of news has been coming out since since that about his, you know, is he involved, is he not involved? Is he going to play Bond? Nothing like that. But Jamie Bell, nonetheless, even if they were just talking to him, uh, he would be a great addition to the to the Bond films in general. He can play like a really good supporting character, maybe even a villain. He's on the younger side. He's he's about thirty, but I mean, it's still it would still be pretty cool. But the big Bond news that came out last week was that Tom Hiddleston is now officially in talks to play James Bond. Say what? That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Tom Hiddleston. So, Hiddleston has been rumored in, to be in talks for the James Bond character for kind of a year now. You know, when you know when Dan, you know when Spectre came out, there were talks about you know who's going to take over the mantle. There was people like uh, Idris Elba, there was people like Clive Owen, there was people like um, Henry Cavill, and Tom Hiddleston was also in the mix. So, this new report suggests these new reports suggest that Tom Hiddleston is now officially in talks, which means there's a very more stronger possibility of him playing Bond. Now, Hiddleston himself has said he's a huge fan of Bond and talked about possibly playing the character, saying he would love the idea of playing the character and knows, you know, the physical demands of what the character brings. Now, Hiddleston himself is a pretty solid choice. I mean, he's proven he's a fan favorite and he's a great actor at that. So, I mean, him playing James Bond, will just it seems like the natural next step for him. But, uh, and we need to remember, Hilliston is just in talks. He hasn't officially signed on. And, you know, again, there's that report and there's that feeling that no one really knows Craig's contract, that he's maybe still under a one film deal. Uh, again, we don't, re- and then, you know, he had all those colorful, let's just call them colorful remarks and comments about coming back or not, you know, or not coming back to play Bond. Either way, it looks like James Bond is going to be something we'll, we're going to be talking about for at least a good chunk of time. And we have another report from James Bond that we'll get to a little bit, little bit later on the podcast, since we're talking about the stuff that came out last week. But Hilston for James Bond, I'm all for. He's a great choice, a solid choice. Let him do it. All right, so the next news item we're going to talk about that came out last week, The God Particle. Its cast has gotten pretty impressive since the last time we talked about it. Now, the last time we talked about it, it was, uh, it was just two members, David Alowo from Selma and Interstellar and Gugu Mothra Raw. I think I'm pronouncing her, her last name wrong, but that's another story. Uh, she was in the film Beyond the Lights. She was also in Concussion. They were the only two people attached. And J.J. Abrams, was. It, it's going to be a J.J. Abrams produced film. He's not directing, he's producing it under his Bad Robots banner. Well, since then, it's gotten a pretty impressive cast. And it just added two cast members last week as well. Or actually, I should say three cast members. So the new cast includes the people I just mentioned, Alawalo, and I can't. I think I'm pronouncing his last name wrong too, and uh, and Mothra Ra. And now the new cast members include Daniel Brühl, who we just saw in Captain America: Civil War. He played Zemo. Elizabeth Dubecki. She was in The Great Gatsby. She was also in The Man from Uncle. And now the cast has uh, grown a little bit more and has added Crystal Dow. He was in Pirate Radio, and he was also in Bridesmaids. He's actually replacing John Krasinski from the TV show The Office. He, I guess, dropped out, or scheduling conflicts got in the way, so he had to drop out, and they brought in Chris O'Dowell. And they've also added John Ortiz. He was in the Fast and the Furious movies. He was in Silver Linings Playbook. I think you'll know him when you see him. He's kind of one of those actors where you're like, oh, okay, yeah, he plays a lot of supporting characters. Put it that way. 
Uh, they've also added uh, Askel Henny. He was in a fantastic film, uh, I believe from Denmark, called Headhunters. And it's him, and it's the guy who plays Jamie Lannister, uh, Nickel Jai, uh, Waldo Costner, I think that's how you say his name. I'm not sure. But uh, he's in there as well. He was also in The Martian last year. He played one of the uh, the astronauts that go to save um, uh, Matt Damon's character. And they've also added Zhang ZZ. She was, of course, the uh, one of the main characters in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And she was also in Rush Hour 2. She was the one that fights Chris Tucker at the very end. So they've all been added to the cast. And uh, the God Particle takes place in the near future and centers on a team of astronauts who make a terrifying discovery that challenges all they know about the fabric of reality of reality as they desperately fight for survival. Now, what is that discovery, you ask? Well, the Earth disappears. That's right. The Earth <laughs> that we all know disappears and in its place is an unknown spacecraft. Now, there's no word yet on who the cast members are playing, but we can only assume that all these cast members are part of that, you know, that crew that astro- of the astronauts. But the other big question, and this is probably the bigger one, is, is the God Particle connected to the Cloverfield universe? Now, when this news came out, it was right after 10 Cloverfield Lane came out. And 10 Cloverfield Lane was, of course, connected somehow to the Cloverfield universe if you follow all the online craziness that's going on. There's this, you know, this whole thing about uh, how it was co- uh, how John Goodman's character was connected to the company that caused the events of the monster from Cloverfield. To co- it's this whole crazy thing. If you know about it, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know about it, you know, go online and look it up. It's just, I, I'm sure there's a website that connects it all. It's it's crazy. It really is crazy. And it's it's and it's a fun little you know, thing that maybe will add to the experience of watching Cloverfield and 10, 10 Cloverfield Lane. But nonetheless, uh, the, when this came out, when the when the first, you know, report came out of the God Particle, there was a lot of speculation that maybe it would be connected to the Cloverfield universe that J.J. Abrams is creating with his bad robot production company. Now, 10 Cloverfield Lane had nothing to do with Cloverfield. It was originally called The Cellar, or uh, the, the Bunker, or The Cellar, I forgot which one it was. I think it was The Cellar. And it had no connection to the Cloverfield films. It wasn't even called Cloverfield. Like I said, it was called The Cellar or The Bunker. One of those two. I forgot what it was. I think it was The Cellar. But anyway, um, they went back and they changed the ending to make it connected to somehow the Cloverfield universe. And, and there was a lot of people saying that maybe Cloverfield is just a term that J.J. Abrams is going to use in the movies that connects these movies together in kind of like a Twilight Zone kind of franchise. Which seems pretty cool if that's the case. Now, you know, Cloverfield, if you actually look into why the movie was called Cloverfield, it was because J.J. Abrams and the, and the director of the film, Matt Reeves, it was the name of the street where the studio is or was. I don't know if they moved the studio. But that's why they called it Cloverfield. And now it's kind of this thing that's been, you know, has been stuck and everyone's kind of going crazy about. But nonetheless, whether it's connected or not, the God Particle has an amazing cast, and the concept sounds pretty cool. Nonetheless, it sounds pretty awesome if they can make it work. So the God Particle, we'll find out more. Production is expected to begin uh, pretty soon, since the God Particle has a release date currently of February 24th, 2017, so next year. So we'll probably hear more about the God Particle sooner rather than later. All right, let's go to some casting announcements that came out last week or over the weekend. Kingsman, The Golden Circle, adds Jeff Bridges. Kingsman, The Golden Circle cast is already pretty impressive. You know, you got Taron Egerton coming back. You got Mark Strong coming back. You also have uh, possibly Colin Firth coming back. That's still a little sketchy. But you have new cast members in Halle Berry, Channing Tatum, Pedro Pascal, and Julianne Moore, who's playing the villain. And now you add Jeff Bridges. And uh, like kind of like they've been doing pretty much with all the new kind of casting uh, members, they've been releasing like these posters for all the characters. And the poster for Jeff Bridges is it, it kind of gives you the feel of, OK, yeah, we're probably seeing someone and the, the vibe of kind of what the, the poster was kind of seems a little like someone we, you know, someone Jeff Bridges have played in the past. Yeah, well. You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. We don't know yet, so we'll find out. But Jeff Bridges, anyway, anytime we see Jeff Bridges on screen is a, is a good time. So, 
Uh, the Kingsman, the Golden Circle, we'll see Eggsy and Merlin, Taron uh, Egerton and Mark Strong, coming to America to be helped by the Kingsman counterparts, the Statesmen. Filming is expected to begin soon, and Kingsman, the Golden Circle is set for a June 16th, 2017 release. Rosa Salazar joins Battle Angel, the long and developed manga adaptation of Battle Angel Attila, now titled Battle Angel, has found its lead. Last month, a short list of actresses in contention for the role was released, and it turns out one of the names actually got the role. Rosa Salazar has landed the lead role in the Robert Rodriguez directed film that will be produced by James Cameron. James Cameron was originally going to direct, but he gave over the directing duties to Robert Rodriguez. Collider got the exclusive. That Salazar beat out the shortlist actresses in Sedea and Micah Monroe for the Yukuto Kashiro series, which takes place in the 26th century and tells the story of an asthmatic female cyborg who is rescued from the scrapyard by a doctor. Rebuilt with no memory from her previous life except for her martial arts skills, she becomes a bounty hunter tracking down vicious criminals. Salazar may not be the most you know, well-recognized household name, but she was in NBC's Parenthood, she was an Insurgent, she was on the FX comedy Man Seeking Women, and she was also her biggest role in that kind of the only thing I've, and not, well, not kind of, the only thing I've seen her in, uh, she was in Maze Runner's The Scorch Trials, which I thought she was, she did pretty well in that. Uh, she was gonna, she's also going to appear in the new Chips film, which we talked about here in the podcast very briefly, and she's in talks to join the new Johnny Quest movie that Robert Rodriguez has been attached to for a few years now. So there's a good little working relationship going on there. And again, I've only seen her in the Scorch Trials, and she was pretty good in that. And, you know, she's a relatively newcomer to the scene. Not, not a lot of people know who she is, so this could be potentially her, you know, another big breakout role for her. If, uh, if, you know, if the film does really well, there's no word yet on when production will start, but now that the film has a director and a lead star production could begin sooner rather than later. Uh, I don't know too much about Battle Angel. Yeah, I know it's a manga adaptation and I think there was a movie. I could be wrong about that. I, I, I know some, I, I don't know too many people that, that have, that know about Battle Angel. I know, um, at least just like, uh, probably about two that have read Battle Angel and they were kind of, you know, really looking forward to this. So we'll see what happens. Uh, and I believe the last news item, yes, it is the last news item from last week's news. Could the animated Spider-Man film focus on Miles Morales? Now, Tom Holland made his, might I say his name word, Tom Holland, uh, made his debut as the new Peter Parker slash Spider-Man in Captain America Civil War before his own solo film, Spider-Man Homecoming. However, when that film was announced, Sony Pictures announced that they will be doing an animated Spider-Man movie. Now, not much is known about the animated Spider-Man movie plot-wise. We know it's been written by Phil Lord and Chris Miller, people that did the Jump Street movies and the Lego movie, and it will not be connected to the live-action Marvel Cinematic Universe. So it's going to be in its own little universe, it's going to be an animated Spider-Man movie. I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're going to do it. Now, this is just... It's, it's a bit of a rumor. It, it's not a bit of a rumor. It is a rumor. There's no confirmation of this actually happening, but there's some information about the film that it could follow Miles Morales. Now, for those not in the know, Miles Morales became the new Spider-Man back in 2011 in the Marvel Comics alternate universe uh, titled Ultimate. Ask your comic book savvy nerd friend for better information. But <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. It's an alternate universe. It's, it, it's, it's, just ask your friends. Or look it up online. And now, this would be an interesting... But nonetheless, this would be an interesting direction for the studio if they went m- with Morales. Not only because he's a fan favorite, but because he's half black and half Puerto Rican. So, that's 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 pretty cool. You know, it gives, it gives a different audience someone to latch onto and someone to, you know, follow. There's no information if this will happen, but the possibility in itself is really cool. Now, I don't want to give too much away about Morales' origin for the sake of Sony probably getting into it, but if Sony does do it and they pull it off, it's going to be pretty, pretty cool. Now, the animated Spider-Man movie will come out on December 21st, 2018, so it's still a long ways away, but I have a feeling that we'll be t- talking about the animated Spider-Man film uh, you know, more and more as, as the year goes on. All right, so that's what all the news items that came out last week. <laughs> After the podcast went up, let's talk about the news items that came out this week. Starting with 
Transformers The Last Night villain has been revealed. And uh, it's Megatron. Yeah, Transformers The Last Nights, the villain in the movie will once again be Megatron. Why? 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 Why would they do this? Can you tell how excited I am? Now, Bay uh, made his inst- made an Instagram post that showed a close-up of Megatron's face. It looks to be a new design. I I just don't care anymore. I mean, it, they keep promising that you know the Transformers movies are going to be different, and then they do something like this, where they bring back an old villain, someone that's been done, someone that has died and has been brought back to life. Just bring someone in. Just bring someone new in. Bring you you know bring Unicron in. Bring someone else in. You know, it's it's getting old. I, I, I don't care about Megatron. I don't care about Transformers movies anymore. And probably the biggest what the hell is going on news this week. Anthony Hopkins has joined Transformers The Last Night. Yes, Sir Anthony Hopkins has joined Transformers The Last Night. Now, there's no real news on, me, on who he will play. Uh, there's no word if he will play... Or, uh, a human character, uh, will he be good, will he be bad, will he be an Autobot, will he, or be voicing an Autobot, or will he be voicing a Decepticon, we don't know. Or will he be voicing the, you know, the titled Last Night, which w- would make the most sense and kind of makes, you know, perfect sense, you know, have a big name actor like Anthony Hopkins uh, voice a character like that, I think it'd be pretty cool. It's still a bit weird, it's interesting, but, and exciting, you know, Anthony Hopkins, but... It's it's still uh, it's still a little weird. Mary Poppins Returns has a release date. Disney is doing a Mary Poppins sequel. It is not a remake. It is a sequel slash reboot since they recasted Mary Poppins. But again, we don't know how it's, we don't know how they're gonna make it work. So Disney's doing a Mary Poppins sequel. It has been titled Mary Poppins Returns. It will star Emily Blunt as Mary Poppins, which is a pretty good casting choice, if I don't say so myself, even though I had nothing to do with casting Emily Blunt in the Disney movie. And it has a release date. The film will also include Hamilton star and creator Lin-Manuel Miranda as a new character created for the film called Jack. He will be a street lamp lighter. So the film will be released in a prime slot that's going to make it probably a crap ton of money. Christmas Day. That's right. Mary Poppins Returns will open on December 25th, 2018 the movie will be directed by rob marshall who has a history of musical films like chicago and and uh into the i believe he directed into the woods so the film is in is in pretty good hands and uh, again it has a has a, a very very good release date so mary poppins returns opens on december 25th 2018 for all you mary poppins fans zootopia is still breaking records now Disney's animated film Zootopia, uh, it's still it's still for somehow still breaking records. It uh, back in March Zootopia became the uh, became Disney's largest box office opening ever, and now it's crossed another big number. According to Forbes, Zootopia is close to breaking the billion dollar mark at the worldwide box office, placing it in direct competition with two other Disney films, Toy Story Three. And Frozen. Not only that, Zootopia is now the second largest, or second biggest, I'm sorry, original movie released ever. Right behind, wait for it, Avatar. And is also Disney's 11th biggest movie at the global box office and the 6th biggest non-sequel of all time. Not bad for a movie that came out in March and uh, is at the moment the second largest grossing movie of the year right behind Captain America Civil War. Pretty impressive. Not bad, Zootopia. It's, uh, and Zootopia was a good movie, you know, it had a lot of themes in there that surprised me and and surprised everyone. Uh, so Zootopia was really good. If you haven't seen Zootopia yet and you get a chance to watch it, you really should. It's a great film. Yeah, a lot of fun. All right, so Dwayne Johnson. Speaking about Zootopia, someone else is very impressive with box office numbers. Dwayne The Rock Johnson has confirmed he will appear and lead Shane Black's Doc Savage. Because who needs sleep? (laughs) Sleep is for pansies, apparently. He's been rumored for uh, Shane Black's Doc Savage uh, since uh, a few months ago, actually. 
We didn't talk about it here on the podcast because it wasn't confirmed. Johnson himself, of course, as he always does, confirmed the casting on his Facebook page. Not his Instagram page, which is very, uh, very strange, but his Facebook page, uh, where he that he will be in Shane Black's Doc Savage movie. He had a picture of him with the writers of the film, and it looks like he'll also be a producer of the film because the vice president of his production company, Seven Buck Productions, was also there. Doc Savage, for those of you guys who don't know, and I had to look this up because I, I don't know too much about Doc Savage either, Doc Savage was an iconic character from the 1930s and 40s who had his own books, magazines, comics, and radio plays. Because, you know, they used to have TV shows on the radio. Back in the day. Back in the day. Uh, Savage was also a scientist, an explorer, and uh, all-around adventurer guy who, you know, went around and, uh, you know, did his thing, saved the world. So Shane Black, this has been a project, a passion project for Shane, for Shane Black for a long time. He's been wanting to do this film, uh, you know, since he started directing and, you know, it's, it's finally come to fruition for him, which I'm very, very happy that he gets to do his passion project and, you know, do with someone like Jane, like, uh, like Dwayne Johnson. So, I mean, there's that. Filming for Doc Savage is expected to begin next year adding to Johnson's already very, very busy schedule. Because, like I said, who needs sleep, right? Uh, not The Rock. Yeah, I think he's a robot. I think I think we've established that The Rock is a robot now. Daniel Day-Lewis and Paul Thomas Anderson are possibly reuniting. That's right, the actor-director duo that made waves with their film There Will Be Blood will possibly be reuniting for a 1950s fashion film set in New York. The report suggests that every uh, that everything is still in the very early stages and doesn't even have a studio attached yet. But with Daniel Day Lewis, who has been attached to the project for some time now, and with Paul Thomas Anderson possibly coming on board, a studio could finally be taking interest and bring these two back together for a big film and get it out there. It sounds pretty exciting. You know, Daniel Day Lewis hasn't really done a film since uh, since I, I I think Lincoln, which was like three years ago at this point now which was uh that's that's far too long to have a great actor like daniel day lewis out in theaters so i mean let's let's get something with these two back back at it and getting back in the big screen all right let's move on to the next news item which is connected to the dc extended universe films of course dope director rick famuia i think that's how you say his name is in talks to direct the flash now, back in April, Seth Graham Smith dropped out of the director's chair for The Flash, citing there were some creative differences between him and the studio. But there was also a news report that came out that said Warner Brothers and DC Films were looking for a more experienced director to bring the Scarlet Speedster t- to the big screen. So, uh, Famu Yiwa, again, don't know if I'm saying his last name right, uh, he's really, he's directed a lot of films, he's directed film, he's directed, uh, films like, um, The Wood, Brown Sugar, and Our Family, but he made waves last year, I believe it was last year, with his great indie, uh, film called Dope, and Dope was one of my favorite films of last year, it was also one of my best films of last year that I saw, so him coming and being in talks to direct a flash is pretty cool. Now, according to Deadline, the studio is, quote, looking for the right chemical mix on its superhero picture line based on DC Comics heroes. And the feeling internally was that Femiua provided a vision that would resonate with younger viewers, and that vision was very compatible with the script the studio is moving forward, with the st- moving forward toward the Starcade with. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but that kind of sounds like maybe, you know, they're going away from the dark tone grittiness that was Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Uh, and again, I like Dope, and I think uh, what he did in that film, it was a coming-of-age film. I'm not saying The Flash is a coming-of-age movie, but it was, you know, very, you know, he handled, you know, the the complexities, and he had a pretty young cast in that film. Ezra Miller, I mean, he's not, you know, young, but he, he is younger than the other cast members in the Justice League, so there is that. But um, I think this is pretty cool. Uh, he, he's a great director. He's a up and coming director as well. If you want to throw that in there, so I think th- I think this is pretty cool. Probably be hearing little stuff here and there from the Flash. It's still a ways away. The Flash will open on March sixteenth, 
2018, but this is pretty exciting news overall. Jesse Eisenberg has joined Justice League Part 1. Now, whether you like this performance or not, Jesse Eisenberg is now our Lex Luthor and is set to return sooner rather than I think maybe some of us probably wanted or expected. But we don't know how much screen time he will have, how he will, you know, factor into the, into the story and into the movie. There's already been rumors that Stefan Wolf will be the villain in Justice League Part 1, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But Lex Luthor will be in Justice League Part 1, which is already filming, so we can probably expect some on-set photos of Jesse Eisenberg soon on set. Justice League Part 1 opens on November 17th next year. Sticking with the DC Extended Universe, Jeremy Irons, who played Alfred in Batman v Superman, said it deserved the bad reviews. Now, it's it's a bit rare to, to, he, to hear and read an actor or actress come out and say bad things about a movie they've done, or they've been in. However, every once in a while, someone does it, and it's met with, you know, praise or criticism, and when it's justified, everyone, you know, that it's, just, it's a whole different it's a whole different story. Now, Jeremy Irons spoke to the Daily Mail and said the long-awaited superhero film Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice deserved the less than flattering critical response it got, and promises that the studio is trying to do better with Justice League Part 1. Here's what he said. It was sort of overstuffed. It was very muddled. I think the next one will be simpler. The script is certainly a lot smaller. It's more linear. Now, Irons will also appear in Justice League Part 1 as well. Now, again, it's not the smartest thing for an actor and actress to, you know, do, you know, to bash a film they've been a part of or something like, something like that. But, looking at you, Shia. But, um, you know, Jeremy Irons, very respected actor you know, in the industry and, and, you know, everyone has nice things to say about him. But, you know, when the, the criticism of their own work, again, is true, it kind of lends itself to be like, well, if he agrees with it. And it's not like he's bashing the film. He just says that all the other bashing and the bad reviews for the film was deserved. And he's right. Again, this is a conversation we've had on, on, on the podcast. And it's a conversation that we'll probably continue to have as soon as we'll see what happens with Justice League. But Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice was not a great film. It was overstuffed. It was like it was trying to build a world way too quickly. It felt a bit muddled. There was editing issues and you know all this other stuff. So Jeremy Irons coming out and saying, "Yeah, I deserve bad reviews," is you know, not necessarily a bad thing. It's not going to ruin his career. It's not going to. Oh, they're just going to kill Alfred now because what he said. No, he's right. And you know the moves that DC and Warner Brothers have been making kind of s seem like they're agreeing with Irons because you know Zack Snyder's no longer kind of the head of DC Films, you know, they bought Jeff Johns in, they bought one of the producers for Warner Brothers that has worked on the films before, uh, Charles, uh, uh, not Charles, I think it's Charles, no, I think it's Charles, Charles Roven, who was one of the producers of, uh, since the Batman Begins films, you know, he's taking a more lesser role at Warner Brothers in DC, it's all this, you know, all, all this moving around that, you know, when someone like this, who was close to the production, says, yeah, you know, it deserved the bad reviews. You kind of had to agree. It's a different story. It's not someone going out there and being like, yeah, my movie sucked. I don't know why I was in it. No. It's him and it's comments like this that, again, wasn't attacking the film. It was just saying, yeah, we deserved our bad reviews. And speaking about Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, a new trailer and a kind of a, a trailer for the Blu-ray and DVD came out and it shows a lot of footage that we didn't see in the uh, in the theater cut, and it, I don't know. Again, you know, it's it's hard to kind of judge. Be like, yeah, you know, we're, I'm gonna go watch that you know longer movie of a movie that I didn't like originally. Uh, it does show Jenna Malone's character though. Jenna Malone, briefly, very briefly, it looks like she's talking to Lois Lane. So there's a lot of, you know, it brings up the speculation again that maybe Jenna Malone isn't playing Barbara Gordon. Um, I'll put the link down below so you guys can go watch it. Uh, again, it's 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 basically just a, a a trailer for the DVD and the Blu-ray that's coming out soon. Another film that people are very uh, critical about and hasn't even come out yet: Ghostbusters. Dan Aykroyd gave his thoughts on the boat on the on the Ghostbusters on the Ghostbusters reboot. 
Dan Aykroyd, one of the main actors and writer for the original Ghostbusters films, went on social media and gave his thoughts about the much-talked-about Paul Feig-directed Ghostbusters reboot, and here's what he said. As originator of the original, saw test screening of the new movie, apart from the brilliant, genuine performances from the cast, both, feel, uh, both female and male, and has more laughs and more scares in the first two films, plus Bill Murray is in it. As one of the millions of man fans in Ray's stance, I'm paying to see that and bringing all my friends. Now, the comments have been very mixed. Some people are saying, well, if it's good enough for Dan Aykroyd, the guy who created it, then okay. And some fans are a little bit more, you know, they're a little bit more suspicious. You know, Dan Aykroyd has, you can arguably say, an investment toward the Ghostbusters reboot because, again, he was the man that created this world and these characters that Paul Feig is rebooting. Not remaking, rebooting. And we've talked about Ghostbusters on the podcast, again, it's very heated, but, you know, this is, again, this is a guy who created the series, the guy that created the characters coming out and saying this. Now, is he just saying this so he can get fans to go, like, go watch this movie because he probably maybe has in the... And a producer credit somewhere or whatever. Again, is he saying this so he can get people in? Or is he just saying this to be like, yeah, I don't want to say anything bad about the film because it's still Ghostbusters and, you know, my name's attached to it. Either way. I don't know. I originally thought if it's good enough for Dan Aykroyd, the guy who created it, it should be good enough for you. But at the same time, you know, looking back, now looking back at him, I was like, well, yeah, he said it, but does he mean it? Because again, he does have connections to the Ghostbusters movies. He's not, you know, a director. He's not, you know, he has a, a role in it, I think, like a cameo, but he's not someone who's very heavy-handed and involved like he was in the originals. We'll see what happens with Ghostbusters. I'm still open-minded, hoping that the film is at least okay, at least enjoyable. Uh, I'm not look, going in and look, you know, looking forward, you know, looking for a masterpiece. I'm not. The second trailer was ten times better than the than the first trailer that that was released, but we'll see what happens. You know, Dan Aykroyd is a, is a man of his own. You know, you say whatever he wants, and um, but again, if it's maybe maybe if it's maybe it's true, maybe he's not you know shoehorning it in, being like, go watch go watch the movie that I helped create, guys. No, we'll see what again we'll see what happens. Stephen King's It remake now has a new actor for the famous character Pennywise the Clown. Now, I'm sure whoever they cast as Pennywise the Clown, people will say that it won't be as good as Tim Curry's. However, everyone has a fear of clowns, so I'm sure whoever they put in the creepy clown makeup to terrorize them, they, they don't care who's under the paint. But anyway, Stephen King's Inn has been set for a remake for, uh, I, I believe, like six or seven years? Something like that? And it wasn't until last year where things finally picked up. Andy Muschietti, who directed the film Mama, replaced uh, Kerry Fukunaga, I think that's how his name, who directed Beast of No Nation. He also directed uh, the first season of HBO's True Detective. Uh, he replaced him, uh, the original director, Fukunaga, I think, I, again, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his last name right. Uh, he left over creative differences with the studio, so they bought it Andy Muschietti. But they, you know, the original director, he already had casted someone as Pennywise the Clown in Will Porter. Now, Will Porter, he was in The Revenants, he was in The Maze Runner, he was in Where the Millers. He was set to play Pennywise, but when Fuganaga left, he left as well. So they left the studio with no actor for Pennywise the Clown. Until now. Now that Andy Muschietti is a part of the movie, he's directing the film, the di director in the studio have found their new actor in Bill Sarsgaard. Now, Skarsgård has been in films like Anna Karenia, uh, Allegiance, and, but he's probably most known for his work on the Netflix show Hemlock Grove, where he plays Roman Godfrey. Now, I haven't seen Hemlock Grove. I've just just now, or yesterday when this news broke out, saw who he was, and it turns out he's actually the son of Stellan Sarsgård, and his brother is Alexander Sarsgård, so he's part of the Skarsgård you know, family. And, uh, I don't know, he kind of has a pretty good look to him to play Pennywise. I mean, it's it's creepy. All you need is a guy that looks kind of creepy with or without, you know, clown makeup. And I think he kind of fits the bill. So, the cast of the film uh, is pretty young, so you won't recognize any of the names. So, I'm not even going to tell you the names because you won't recognize any of them. It's a pretty young cast, though. 
and they're going with a direction like the TV movie did, where they're they're filming two parts in the movie. They're filming the first part is telling the story in from the kids' perspective, and the second movie will tell the story of the adults, which is pretty cool. And I think that it could really lend itself to you know bringing us back to what we saw in the original. Of course, many will say the original is so much better, and we don't need this remake, but we have it now. Get used to it. Uh, the current release date for it is September 8th, 2017. Filming for the for the movie is expected to start soon. So we'll probably be hearing more of it in uh, the time to come. Jake Gyllenhaal will lead Ubisoft's Tom Clancy's The Division movie. That's right, Ubisoft will start their own... I started pretty much started their own film division. And will go into full swing when Assassin's Creed comes out later this year. They're also working on a Splinter Cell movie with Tom Hardy in the lead. Uh, that movie's been in the works for a while, so who knows if that's still happening. And there's also going to be a Far Cry movie. They're also working on a Watch Dogs movie. But they now added another film to their list, Tom Clancy's The Division. Not only that, Ubisoft has already landed a lead actor and a producer in Jake Gyllenhaal, making his second video game property film after the not-so-well-received video game adaptation of Prince of Persia called Prince of Persia The Sands of Time. Of those not in the know, Tom Clancy's Division follows an elite force of special ops personnel who, is who are dispatched to New York City in hopes of enforcing the law and eventually rebuilding the city after a devastating viral outbreak on Black Friday. The game itself was based off a fictional scenario by the Department of Homeland Security in hopes of developing a response plan to such an event. It also had a pretty successful launch and has so far gained over $300 million in sales. So with the popularity of the game and the name Tom Clancy and Jake Gyllenhaal being a pretty bankable actor himself, it's not completely surprising that Ubisoft wants to make this into a film. Not only that, The Division doesn't really have a set in its own story, so whoever ends up writing the film and directing the film could go in whatever direction they kind of really want. Now, there's currently no production start date for the film or release date, but with you know Jake Gyllenhaal already attached to the lead and Ubisoft hoping that Assassin's Creed is a highly successful film once it comes out later this year, we can probably see, we'll, you know, we can probably see a, a good cast come together and a good director and writer come in for The Division. Now, I haven't played the game. I've seen other people play the game. I've heard people talk about it. I saw the reviews. And uh, it looks fun. I mean, again, there's no set in stone story. So that's that's one thing that Ubisoft can come in and be like, you know, aside from the fact that, you know, you have these soldiers coming in to try to clean up New York City and rebuild after this deadly outbreak. So you have that. You have, you have a over, you know ominous villain in the virus you got that and you got your team of people your main characters your story and you know your story could be you know maybe they're just, you know i don't know maybe they found a cure i don't know that, that's kind of probably not the direction they want to take but again it's it, they can go anywhere with it so we'll see what happens jake gyllenhaal you know has been has been great and you know the last handful of, of movies he's done and you know, taking another stab at video game properties could be a could be a good direction for him. You know, Prince of Persia, yeah, not not really good, not the worst video game adaptation out there. But in, you know, whatever. All right, so uh, moving on to the next news item, the Sicario sequel now has a new title, now has a new director, but in doing so, it's also lost one of its actors. It was about a month ago or two. It was announced that, Sicario, that a Sicario sequel was in the works, and the plan was to bring back the, orig the original three core actors in the film, Emily Blunt, Benicio Del Toro, and Josh Brolin. The sequel would end up following more of Del Toro's character, who was, in all honesty, one of the better characters of the film, if not the, bear, the, the better character of the film. However, a new report from The Hollywood Reporter says that only Brolin and Del Toro will return, and that Emily Blunt has dropped out. And that the new film will be called Soldado, which is Spanish for soldier. Finally, director Denis Villeneuve will not return since his schedule is too packed at the moment. He is directing the Blade Runner 2, so maybe that's kept him away. And they have found a new director. And director Stefano Soluma. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, he's in talks to take over the director's chair. He hasn't. He's directed a lot of stuff in Italy, 
He's a he's an Italian director, uh, and he's uh, probably going to be known here in America for a miniseries that I think I believe will be coming out here called Cult, which is based on a story by Sergio Leone. Uh, and it looks like the film Soldado will uh, film in the fall, and but there's no release date just yet. So, I mean, I liked Sicario. I thought it was really good. I thought it was a, a very kind of unapologetic look at the, you know, the what they were aiming for. And again, Del Toro is one of the best characters, if not the best character in the film. Losing Emily Blunt is kind of a bummer, but at the same time, if they're going to follow... Benito Del Toro's character more than, you know, one of those characters was going to have to, you know, be in the back burner, and arguably her character was, I want to say the weaker character of the film, uh, because Emily Blunt is an amazing actress, but if you had to get rid of one, then I think it would be her, because I think she kind of served her purpose and her arc for the film, and if coming back, I don't think, maybe, I don't know what they could have done with her more. I mean, they could have, they could have gone down a road that I think would have been good, but I think, if, again, if you're going to follow Benito Del Toro's character, then follow him completely, and follow him to this very dark, seedy world that uh, that they've uh, they've built in the first Sicario. So, I'm looking forward to it. I know a lot of people out there are as well, so we'll, we'll see what happens. The new Friday the 13th movie, yes, I said new Friday the 13th movie, will play around with Jason's origins, because everyone loves a good origin tale. Is that too sarcastic? I think that might have been too sarcastic. <laughs> now, we haven't really talked about the Friday the 13th, uh, the new Friday the 13th movie here on the podcast, mostly because there hasn't been too much to talk about. Writers have come and gone. There was a rumored uh, story that maybe the film would go the found footage route, which thankfully they will not. Now, uh, one of the producers of the film, Brian, uh, Brad Fuller, has, you know, said something very newsworthy that the film will be kind of an origin story and reintroduce the. Pretty much the hockey mask, machete-wielding, unstoppable killing machine that is known as Jason Voorhees to a new audience. Fuller, who's doing uh, press rounds for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, out of the shadows, talked to the real world and told them the new film, which will be uh, ironically the 13th film in the franchise, and currently has Aaron Guzukowski, I think that's how you say his name, I, I, I am sure I'm not saying his last name right, uh, he wrote Prisoners. The Jake Gyllenhaal, we were talking about Jake Gyllenhaal earlier, uh, and uh, Hugh Jackman starring movie, is tackling the story and said this about the origin story, saying Aaron's story has great characters. You know, you have to understand Jason Voorhees. So we go back and we kind of started over and work our way forward. It's an origin that no one has seen before. Obviously, Pamela is there, but is a little bit different from what we've seen before. Now, the Pamela he's referring to is. Pamela Voorhees, a.k.a. Jason's mother, who played a very pivotal role in the very first Friday the 13th film. Now, the remake, or new film, uh, I don't think there's a proper way to call it that just yet, uh, will head back to the camp, Camp Crystal Lake, and might show once again how Jason was killed. Maybe. They're, they're still Again, they're still working out the details of the story. However, Birth Movies Death reports the film could introduce Jason's father, who will be who is named Elias Voorhees. Now Elias has never appeared in the films, although producers have tried to introduce him. And I think he was mentioned briefly in passing in I believe Jason Goes to Hell or Jason Takes Manhattan. No, it probably was Jason Goes to Hell. It was briefly mentioned that, but the character has appeared in various comic book stories and novelizations. He appeared in a comic book named Friday the thirteenth Pamela's Tale which I won't spoil the ending, I found out the ending by reading it and kind of ruined the surprise for me, but there's no word yet on if he'll, if he'll actually appear, but if they wanted to go down the origin route, it would be a good way to finally bring this character to the big screen since they've been trying for so long now. I'm not sure an origin tale is, is, a, is, a, is the right direction to go with Friday the 13th, considering that we don't really need to better understand, quote-unquote, Jason. I mean, he's... He's Jason Voorhees. He kills a lot of people and sometimes does in a very creative way. He doesn't care who you are. Man, woman, nope, don't matter. Crippled, uh, he doesn't care. He don't care. He'll kill you because you're, you're on his property and you're having sex when you shouldn't be. And, you know, and then you die. Um, but that's the way Hollywood works. And, and if they can make it work, then, you know, more power to them. 
uh, you know, they they um, they tried doing a little more with uh, with the Jason character in the remake they did. Uh, I believe it was back in 2009. I want to say I'm not sure of the year, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't good. It it, it was terrible. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, it, again, if they if they can you know make this work, if they can make it a a good origin story, I guess, and make us better understand Jason, then okay, let's do it. Fine, just make it good. That's all I want. All I want is another good Friday Thirteenth movie. Friday the Thirteenth is currently scheduled for a January Thirteenth. Hey, how about that? Two thousand seventeen release, but they haven't even started filming yet. There's no projected filming date, so there's a good chance that they can probably that they will probably move the release date, which would put it, by the way, ironically, in another Friday the 13th release date in October. I think that's a better release spot. Just saying. And it's some pretty exciting news that I'm <laughs> I might be like the only one. I'm probably not the only one, but I'm I'm pretty excited for this. Kate Blanchett is eyeing the female Ocean's Eleven spinoff. Which is pretty cool. Also, Jennifer Lawrence might be out. Now, Kate Blanchett is reportedly in negotiations to join the Ocean's Eleven female spin-off film that we've talked about on the podcast before that will be directed by Gary Ross, who directed the first Hunger Games, and will star Sandra Bullock as the lead character. There was even reports, again, early on, that Jennifer Lawrence was looking to sign on too, but it looks like Lawrence might be out due to scheduling conflicts because they want to start filming the movie in the fall. So, and it might, you know, obviously conflict with something else she's filming. Hence, scheduling conflicts. See how that works? <laughs> I'm treating you like you're five years old. You don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, the playlist also reports that Kate Blanchett would join, could join the film and take over the Brad Pitt-like character, a.k.a. the second-in-command, which was the character that Jennifer Lawrence was originally attached to play, or in talks attached to play. But it would make sense that, you know, if they can't get Lawrence, they would go with another big actress or with another another well-known actress. And Kate Blanchett, which, I mean, that that's kind of, you, you can't get any bigger than that, really. Uh, which would be pretty, again, which would be pretty cool. Uh, there was also a report that maybe George Clooney's character, Danny Ocean, could appear. But uh, they could be saving his perform his, you know, entrance uh, for a potential sequel. Because, again, it's a spin-off of the Ocean's Eleven movies that Steven Sodenberg directed. And um, Sandra Bullock, early reports suggested that she would play uh, Danny Ocean's sister. So it's, uh, I mean, it's kind of cool. Uh, I mean, I, I like this idea. I like Steven Sodenberg's The Ocean's movies that he did. And uh, I think this kind of spin-off of, all, of, all, of, of an all-female crew can, uh, can be pretty cool. Uh, lastly, the film doesn't have an official title yet. They're not going to call it Ocean's Eleven. Uh, It's being referred internally as Ocean's Ocho, which is Ocean's 8, so maybe there'll be a lesser, not a lesser crew, but a a smaller crew than the the Ocean's 11. Uh, So if Blanchett does sign on to Star, we can probably be hearing a lot more from this project, especially if they do indeed move forward with, you know, filming later this fall. Alright, so I mentioned... We'll be talking about James Bond more in the podcast, and now the time has come. Sam Mendes, who directed Skyfall and Spectre, will not be coming back to direct the next James Bond movie. Now, I believe, if I remember correctly, Mendes has said in the past that he's not going to come back and direct another James Bond movie. But now it kind of seems that it is con- confirmed that he will not come back. He spoke at the Hay Festival of Literature in Wales, where he mentioned it was an incredible venture. I loved every second of it, but I think it's time for somebody else. Again, I think he kind of said, you know, he said this in the past, but Mendes hopes that the successor comes from an unexpected direction. And speaking of that, going to a little segue here, it looks like maybe they're eyeing up another director for James Bond 25. Obviously they are. And it does kind of come a little unexpected. It's not a big name. Now, according to Radio Times, it appears the producers in the studio may hire Suzanne Bear to take the director's chair. Now, Bear is not a, is not just a front runner; she has also worked with Tom Hiddleston on the AMC miniseries *The Night Manager*, which not only got good reviews, but Hiddleston also played a spy-like character. 
Barrett isn't a big, uh, she isn't obviously big in America. She's directed a lot of films in her native Denmark. Uh, the only kind of real American film she's done, American film she's done, is uh, Serena with that had Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence. That wasn't really met with a lot of fanfare. Directing a Bond film could be your big break here in the States. And if Hiddleston gets the role, she already worked with him, and they obviously have a very good working relationship. Now, it's still early, so there's no guarantee that Susanna Bear will get the job. I, uh, I, I don't even want to go on the limb and say she's the first female director for a James Bond film, because I don't think that's true. I'm sure there was probably another female director. Although, that's not true. Not that it matters who directs a James Bond film, but... I should have looked that up. I really should have, but I didn't. But uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. You know, now they're looking at directors. They're looking at uh, they're looking at new James Bond. So it kind of looks a little bit like maybe Daniel Craig might be out. Again, we don't know. We'll probably find out sooner rather than later. I'm sure. All right, let's go and talk about some rumors because there are some big ones out there for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Two rumors that came out from Joe Blow: Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. The villain has been potentially revealed, and Thor Ragnarok, Ragnarok, however you want to say it, I'm going to go with Ragnarok, will include elements from Planet Hulk. Yes! 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 Now, some interesting rumors. Again, these are very interesting rumors. These are some very interesting rumors, and they come from Joe Blow, who have a pretty decent track record. Now, first, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. They say Elizabeth Dubecki, again, the Great Gatsby and... The from the man from Uncle, and who will appear in the God Particle that we talked about earlier on the podcast, who was already part, who was already part of the cast, will play the the film's villain, in Aisha, aka her, aka Kismet. Think I think that's how you say. It. Now, for those not in the know, including myself, I don't know who this character is. We'll just call her her because that's one of the names for her in the comics. Was created by a group called the Enclave, that are dedicated to taking control of the world, starting with the creation of the perfect genetic beings made to restart humanity their first version was someone called him which would evolve into the character and a fan favorite character at that of adam warlock who may or may not have been in the first guardians of the galaxy in the collector's trophy room in a cocoon he also escaped the enclave so you know and it's been rumored that he may or may not appear in guardians of the galaxy's volume 2 now, when it comes to her, she would eventually go and try to find Adam Morlock slash him, who she considers to be the perfect mate to perfect mate to start a new race. Now, Dubecky probably isn't a big household name, but she's pretty. She's been pretty good in everything she's done so far. She had a small role in The Great Gatsby, which she was great in. She played the villain in The Man from Uncle. She was pretty good in that. She had a very small role in Everest, which she was okay in that, and she was in The Night Manager with Tom Hiddleston, which she was great, pretty great in too. This would also mark the second female villain for the Marvel Cinematic Universe right behind Kate, Kate Blanchett's Hela in Thor Ragnarok. So we don't know if that's going to... Now, if she's the villain, then okay, go with that. Elizabeth Dubeck is a fine actress. She can probably handle it, so we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens there. So, speaking of Thor Ragnarok, this rumor is pretty huge because it's one that fans have been wanting to see for a very long time. Again, this comes from Joe Blow. And they say the Planet Hulk will be adapted into the third Thor film. Specifics are unclear, but it looks like the Gladiator games from that storyline will factor into the story of Thor somehow becoming involved in the games themselves that might be overlooked by Jeff Goldblum's character, Grandmaster, who has a history and knack of doing this in the comics. He's also, the Grandmaster, the brother of the Collector, played by Benicio Del Toro. Fans will also get to see the Hulk wearing his one-shoulder armor that he donned in that he donned in the comics. However, that won't be the only costume change. They, Joe Blow also says that Thor will be sporting a shaved head, but not completely bald, for at least a portion of the film, and that Tessa Thompson's character Valkyrie, who is usually blonde in the comics, will not be blonde here. She instead will be having war paint on her face, on her face, much like a Native American warrior. Now, Joe Blow, Joe Blow has some rumored store details as well saying that thor is trying to track down and the ultimate weapon to stop ragnarok and reset the universe what that weapon is is still a mystery but they are some strong there are some strong speculation and suggestions that it could be the last infinity stone 
Again, that's just speculation at this point. So there you go, two big rumors for uh, the next uh, Marvel movies. Now, Planet Hulk, of course, being the big one. People have been wanting Planet Hulk. People just want more Hulk in general. They want another Hulk movie. But here's the thing with Planet Hulk. The Hulk movies haven't been that successful in the box office. However, the Hulk is a very popular character. Planet Hulk is also a very popular story arc and comics for for fans. And I think this is a good way to bring in Planet Hulk. You know, there's already talks of there was talks earlier that uh, Thor Ragnarok would be kind of a, a cop, a buddy cop kind of dynamic between Thor and and the Hulk. So if that's the case, what better way to start off? You know, that by having them beat the crap out of each other in the Gladiator games, probably, to, you know, find this, you know, whatever weapon it is. Having Planet Hulk in the Thor movie is probably, a, again, probably the best way to do it and a good way to, you know, do it. Bring in the, be- you know, bring the best parts of that storyline and put it in a film that you know everyone's going to see or that a good chunk of people are going to see. I think that's the best way to do it. I really do. I, I th- Will it be cool to see a, a, a feature-length film on Planet Hawk? Probably. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, if you can bring elements, the best elements of that storyline, and do it with other characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think that could work too. I really do. So, Thor Ragnarok already has a, a, a damn good impressive cast. And if this is true, then I think it's jumping... I think, you know, Thor Ragnarok just jumped to a lot of people's anticipated, you know, movie lists. We'll find out more, obviously, if this is actually true or not. So let's stick with Marvel for a little bit. A little bit more. Yeah? You want to do that? Let's do that. This is pretty big. This, this, is, this is one that I'm really excited for. I kind of geeked out a little bit when I read it. Brie Larson is eyed up for the role of Captain Marvel. So Marvel Studios continues to bring in these big-name actors because why the hell not? Uh, and again, I kind of geeked out over this one. So Variety reported that Brie Larson is in early talks to play Carol Danvers, a.k.a. Captain Marvel. Now Larson would be a great pick for Captain Marvel. She has a, she's been solid in everything she's done. She's been fantastic, you know, whenever she has to be. And she gained her first Oscar for her role in the, in the, movie, in the movie Room. Why the hell not? Let her play Captain Marvel. And, you know, she's, she's, she's a bit nerdy, too. So, you know, I'm pretty sure being a superhero is on her, you know, checklist. And this wouldn't be her first comic book movie. She's actually She was actually uh, in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. She had a very small role in it. She plays uh, Envy Adams. So, I mean, this would be pretty cool. I mean, she's a great actress. And I she she fits the role entirely for me. And Captain Marvel, it's kind of hard to explain what Captain Marvel is. Now, Carol Danvers is... Um, was I believe she was a pilot, and she got infected with um, with alien DNA, and it just kind of changed you know everything about her, and she became the superhero. She became Captain Marvel, and she has she has a great arc in in the comics and everything else. So it's a really great. I don't want to give too much about Captain Marvel because obviously you know Marvel's going to do their own thing, so we don't know how much they're going to follow. But she's a great character, and I can't wait for her to appear on the big screen. And if they they get Brie Larson, I mean, that's it'd be awesome. It really would. That's not the only Captain Marvel news that we got this week. There's been rumors that Marvel has been looking at female directors to direct Captain Marvel, and it looks like there's two big contenders out right now. Jennifer Kent, who directed the film, the horror film The Babadook, and Nikki Carl, who's directed uh, films like Well Rider and McFarlane USA. She also directed uh, North County with Charlie Theron, and she's also in post-production for an adaptation of the bestseller uh, novel The Zookeeper's Wife that stars Jessica Chastain. She's also got another movie, a biopic of opera singer uh, Maria uh, Callas that stars um, Nomi Rapace from the original Girl on the Dragon Tattoo. So they're looking at these two, Jennifer Kent and Nia Caro. I have not watched any, I've been wanting to watch The Babadook. It's on my queue on, not, on Netflix. Yeah, I've just been wanting to watch it. I haven't watched it yet. I didn't want. I haven't watched anything that uh, Nick Carl has done either. Um, but from the things you know, from the things I've heard, um, the Babadook is really good. From what I heard, although then I've heard, then I hear things that it's really bad. So I don't know. I have to be my own judge on that. And um, Nick Carl, I haven't seen North uh, Country. I haven't seen McFarlane USA. 
I've heard mixed things on both, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, nonetheless, though, if Marvel wants to hire a female director to direct Captain Marvel, pretty much their first solo female-led film, let them do it. I, I mean, obviously, no one's going to stop them, obviously, but uh, I think it'd be pretty cool. They the they also have two female writers. They have uh, Meg LaFaro, who had a hand in writing Inside Out, and they have Nicole Perlman, who co-wrote Guardians of the Galaxy. We all know how that turned out. So I I can't wait to, to see Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel, just with them having talks with Brie Larson, has pumped me up and just made me giddy for for this. It's still a ways away though. March eighth, two thousand nineteen is the release date for Captain Marvel. But if they're already looking at directors, they're looking at stars, we can only hope for the best when it comes to uh, to hearing more news from Captain Marvel. So far, so good. It looks great. Alright, let's talk about our last news item of the podcast, which is Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Apparently the first cut didn't impress Disney. Like at all. Uh, and something that has been making... So this has been making waves online. Uh, a report from page six, a not so credible spot, by the way, but a lot of people have been taking this very seriously. It says the first cut of the highly anticipated Star Wars spin off film, Rogue One Star Wars Story, did not impress Disney executives. So much so that these executives, quote, ordered expensive reshoots to take place in July, and that Disney won't take a packed seat and is demanding changes as the movie isn't testing well. Mind you, they're not even test screening the movie. Disney is the only people that have seen... Um, Disney and the editors, I'm sure, are the only people that have seen this movie. Now, a Disney source added that the filmmaking team in the studio always anticipated additional shooting and second unit work to make the film the absolute best it can be, and the actors were aware that there would be additional shooting. Coming off The Force Awakens, there is an incredibly high bar for this movie, and we have a responsibility to the franchise and to the fans to deliver the best possible movie we can. Now again, a lot of people are taking this like, oh my god, the movie's going to be a disaster, the movie sucks. No. Reshoots happen all the time. They're just not newsworthy because they're reshoots. Sometimes they're just additional photography. Sometimes there's stuff they couldn't fit into the you know, production, uh, production time and they were like, okay, well we can't fit this in until we're filming so we're going to wait like a month or two, bring you guys all back and film it then. This happens all the time. Just because Disney is not happy with what Garth Edwards, who is directing the movie, presented in the first cut of the movie, does not mean the movie will suck or be a disaster. It just means that Edwards and everyone else will have to go in and work doubly hard to get the film in tip-top shape. Now, what are the you know what's the reshoots for? And this is kind of a bit disappointing when when you hear it. A report from the Hollywood Reporter says that the reshoots that Disney wants are tonal reshoots. According to them, Disney felt that it, it was, quote, tonally off with what a classic Star Wars movie should feel like. The pick, was not yet, the pick has not yet been tested before audiences, but one source describes the cut as having a feel of a war movie. Adding that the source says this is the closest thing to a prequel ever, and that this takes place just before A New Hope, and leads up to the 10 minutes before the classic film begins, you have to match the tone. So the reshoots are just so they can go back and make it feel less of a war film and reach the same tone that the, the New Hope had right before it starts. Because again, this is a prequel. This follows a group of rebels who go in and try to steal the plans to the Death Star. So it looks like they're going to they're gonna start right before the events of the New Hope starts. Which is fine. Okay, good. It's a prequel. It's the best prequel to date. Fine, good. Let it be that. But let it be a war film. If I remember correctly, when the very first teaser came out, and this is the teaser that everyone else saw, not everyone saw. This is a teaser that I believe came out at D23 or some other big Disney event. I could I could be wrong. What was uh, described, because no one saw it, what was described from the teaser, I mean, there was a leaked version, but I didn't want to see a leaked version because those, those, they're always crappy quality so I don't like watching leaked versions of, uh, of trailers but anyway what it sounded like from reading the description of the tr of this teaser it felt like they were going for war film like there were people supposedly yelling in the trailer there was uh, it looked like it, it felt like the teaser felt like there was a war zone 
So why go back on your why go back on what you originally wanted? That's not that's I don't I don't know that just doesn't feel right to me. It just it feels like it, this is what you promised people very early on, and now you're like, no, we don't want to do a war film. That's kind of a bummer. I kind of want to see a war, you know, a war Star Wars movie. I want to see a war in a Star Wars movie. I really do. I think it'd be really cool. I mean, this is a prequel. It's set during the original timeline. It's not set during the new timeline that that's been established with The Force Awakens. Now, I get that you want the films to be as good or even better than The Force Awakens because everyone knows these movies and you don't want to be the movie that's like, oh, well, that one sucks. I get that. I do. But at the same time, it's like, oh, man, I want, I want to see a war film. I want to see a, a Star Wars war film. Even just the feel of it, I think that would be really cool. Now, I'm not saying that that's probably in a, the war f- the war film feel is all throughout the film. It's probably not. It's probably just a little bit. But it's, it's still, I, I would really, really like to see that. But so it looks like they're just gonna go back and fix some tonal issues, which is kind of it's kind of a shame that they they would want to do that. I mean, you know, it's whatever. But <laughs> there's. Even more stuff coming out from these reshoots, because forget it, there's no way you can have just one new story this week. So, Making Star Wars has released a report uh, that has a little bit more information on the reshoots. Now, Making Star Wars has proven to be reliable in the past, so take this, but take this anyway as a rumor. Rumors all around. So, this is what they claim. They claim they have a source within the crew, and the source has told them this. It was speculated that J.J. Abrams would supervise the reshoots, although it was unlikely because Abrams had moved on from the Star Star Wars franchise and he was done with it. The reshoots will last about a month and a half with the cast and crew working six days a week and the sources sources expect 40% of the Rogue One, a Star Wars story, will be reshot with 32 different sets being recreated. And finally, and this one was shot down by the man himself, they said Christopher McQuarrie was going to work with Gareth Edwards on the reshoots and worked on the script that was saving, quote-unquote, the story. Now, McQuarrie, uh, always one to correct, uh, you know, news out there about himself, shot down this involvement on Twitter the only way he knew how, saying, Attention bloggers, I'm reading some horse shit rumors tonight. You know where to find me. Do your jobs. So, <laughs> that's kind of funny. But, um... Yeah, so 40%, that is overly ridiculous, and that has to be a rumor. There's no way that they are shooting 40% of a movie. It's utterly, it, it's, it, <laughs> I can't even think of a word, I can't even think of a, I can't even think straight right now. That's that's where it is. I can't think straight that they would be filming, or refilming 40% of a movie. If it's true, that's saying you know a lot but at the same time it's like i i, I don't know that's i don't know I, I don't know what to say about that but i like christopher mccrory's uh deal about him uh saying yeah I, i'm i'm do, do your work do your job <laughs> that's kind of funny uh again but again reshoots aren't a big deal i get that you know you put reshoots in front of the word star wars it's gonna it's gonna cause a ruckus i do i get i understand that but at the same time, you know, just, you know, and it's a first cut. Nothing is impressive on the first cut. You always got to go back. You got to redo some stuff. You got to take stuff out. You got to lean stuff down, trim it down. You know, just don't take it. You know, we're going to see the final product. And I'm sure we're all going to love it. Just wait for it. We'll find out. World One Star Wars Story opens on December 16th later this year. Alright, so let's talk about the movies that are coming out this week. We have three big wide releases coming out this week. The first one is Me Before You, based on the novel by Jojo Myers. I say sorry, last name. A girl, played by Amelia Clark, in a small town, forms an unlikely bond with a, par- with a recently paralyzed man, played by Sam Caflin. She's taken care of. The rest of the cast includes Jenna Coleman, Matthew Lewis, Vanessa Kirby, and Charles Dance. The next film is Pop Star Never Stop Stopping. When it becomes clear that his solo album is a failure, a former boy band member, played by Annie Sandberg, does everything in his power to maintain his celebrity status. The cast includes a bunch of famous faces like Image Poots, Bill Hader, Sarah Silverman, 
Maya Rudolph, Will Forte, Will Arnett, Joan Cusack, Adam Levine, Carrie Underwood, Pink, Martin Sheen, and many, many more. The last film is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. The Turtles return to save the city from the dangerous new threat. New cast members include Stephen Amell playing Casey Jones, Brian T. playing the new Shredder, Tyler Perry, Baxter Stockman, Laura Linney playing a character named Rebecca Vincent, WWE superstar Seamus playing Rocksteady, and Gary Anthony Williams playing Bebop, and Brad Garrett voicing Krang. Also, and this is kind of a bummer, this report came out, Judith Hogg, who played the original April O'Neil, uh, shot a cameo in the movie, apparently with Megan Fox, who plays the new April O'Neil. That scene that she was in was apparently cut from the new film, so no cameo from Judith Hogg, which is kind of a shame. I think it would be been really cool to see that, but no longer happening. So, once again, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows, Pop Star, Never Stop, Never Stopping. I think I got it wrong the first time. And Me Before You are the big three wide releases coming out this week. Let's go to box office predictions. Once again, uh, I don't know how, uh, this second time in a row, I got the actual box office right in my predictions. My picks last week were X-Men Apocalypse and number one, Alice Through Looking Glass number two, The Angry Birds Movie number three, Captain America Civil War number four, and Sor uh, Neighbors 2, Sorority Rising at number five. The actual box office were my picks. X-Men, Alice the Looking Glass, The Angry Birds, Captain America Civil War, and Neighbors 2, Sorority Rising. Now, this week is going to be a little different. We got three big movies coming out, and I think only, maybe two of them will only break into the top five. So my picks this week are, of course, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows is going to be number one. No doubt about it. Everyone, that's going to be a huge hit uh, for everyone involved. X-Men Apocalypse will be number two. I think Me Before You will be number three. And I think Captain America Civil War will continue to be in the top five at number four. And number five, this one's a little hard. I think it's either going to be Alice Through Looking Glass. I think Alice Through Looking Glass has a very strong possibility of staying in the top five. However, Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping could break into the top five. I'm not confident about Pop Star Never Stop Never Stop Never Stopping. Uh, if it breaks in the top five box office, it's going to be at number five. It's going to be very low. But I do think that maybe Alistair Looking Glass will probably fight it out. So those two are going to fight it out for the number five uh, spot in the box office. Don't know how that's going to turn out. Uh, I think maybe it will turn to Alice in Wonderland or Alistair Looking Glass. We'll find out. So we have a couple of trailers this week. Uh, not many like usually, like usual. There was the, uh, the Batman v Superman DVD slash Blu-ray trailer that showed a bunch of new footage that will be linked down below. Also, the first trailer for Monster Trucks came out this week and will be down below. The uh, The trailer took a very literal approach to the term Monster Trucks. It's not going to be like the Monster Trucks you see, you know, commercials for, uh, you know, when they come to town. It's, uh, it's very literal. Leave it at that. Trailer's down below if you want to go check that out. Thank you guys so much for joining me on the podcast today. It was very fun. Again, it was a very stacked show. Uh, it's I haven't had a stacked show in a long time. So thank you for keeping that in mind when you when you were listening. If you want to keep up to date or just be ahead of the curve of what we're going to talk about on the podcast, you can like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash movie pits or just click the link down below in the description area. Also, if you want to keep up to date on all my written reviews and some other stuff along the Along the way, you can go to my WordPress account, which is movieswithchris.wordpress.com. Link will also be down below in the comments for you guys to go check out. Thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast this week. Again, it was a stacked week this week. So thank you for sticking with me if you stuck all the way to the end. And have a good weekend, guys. As always, remember, go watch some movies. <laughs>